Hello and welcome back to Infinite Space, where we'll be continuing where we left off, which if you recall is after the human whose name escapes me already and his fellow cadets, fellow squires, were doing a little bit of target practice with... God, I already forgot her name. I forget everyone's names. Um, The big girl's uh, knight. Uh, he was basically having them to do target practice, which is something that she wasn't very happy about because of her cybernetic arms. We also got a little bit of information as to how she got them. And we also saw that... What is his name? The, the mean wolf dude that is also a squire. I'm, not, I'm never going to remember anyone's names. Um, that he was going a little too crazy, being a little too enthusiastic, um, ruining people's fun, so to speak. Um, also, the human tried to do something nice for Calbix, I believe, but then I think he didn't react too well to it, or, but it might have been, like, because he did something wrong, I forget. I don't know, it, it was a, it's been a while. It's, anyway, so, without further ado, let us continue in finite space. Sleep is slow to come and sporadic. My dreams are a mixed mess. They start as a sea of disapproving and scowling faces, changing to the altercation in the shower room between Alex and Brute. They end with Brute towering over me, baton in hand before everything morphs into Calbix's snarling face. I wake abruptly. It all ends with this snout from the evening prior ringing in my ears. Pushing myself out of bed, I find I'm awake well before sunup once more. Dark circles under my eyes greet me in the mirror after moving over to wash my face. I try to shake the lingering feelings of inadequacy the nightmares have left me with. It isn't going to do me any good to try and get more rest at this point. I sit at the desk and think over the last few days. I thought things were going to be easier once I got here. Weren't squires supposed to have this sort of stuff figured out by now? Instead, everything seemed so childish in hindsight. Nightmares and meltdowns were a page thing, surely. Ah, <sighs> Corwin, what are you even doing? I scrunch my eyes shut and then cover my face with my right arm. The page fantasies that I had of what life would be like as a squire crossed my mind. I didn't expect anything to be easy. I expected the training to be grueling. It was the imagined scenarios with my knight that were too fanciful. Waiting on them, training together, as well as maybe late night unprofessional imaginings with the shapeless figure that I thought that I'd be with. At the time, it didn't seem so far off. Now the knightly figure is Calbix, and the situation is real. After the snap last night, it is clear that things aren't going to be like that. Calbix is tolerating me so far, but I keep pushing to do more. The real question I have for myself is, do I keep pushing and trying to force my idea of what kind of squire I want to be onto him? Or do I let Kelbix set the pace and possibly never grow that close? Neither one is ideal, but I don't know what to do. I'm still worrying the issue like a bad tooth, but I freeze when I hear an oddly high-pitched noise. What was that? I strain to make it out, but the noise does not repeat. It sounded like a yelp or a whine. I get up, opening the door into the corridor. I peek my head out and listen for the source. Nothing. I'm about to close the door when I hear it again. Clearly this time. A whimpering moan, muffled but audible, coming from Calbix's room. Is he okay? I tentatively move closer and listen. There it is again. The noises are coming from inside. I still haven't asked if I was allowed to enter his bedroom. If he is in trouble, surely it's okay to enter, right? Reaching out, I try the door and find it's unlocked. As I turn the handle slightly, the door opens inward. Guess I've made my choice. Pushing further, I make just enough of an opening to poke my head in and look around. With the curtains drawn, the room is dark. There is a soft low glow coming from the right corner, accentuated by an almost silent hum of electronics. 
Calvix's flight armor is housed in a display module against a nearby wall. The edge of it is barely in view. Forgetting myself, I take a step forward and enter the room fully. I have to get a better look. The sound freezes me. I turn my head to find the source. Calvix lies in a grandiose canopy bed, slightly obscured by blue chiffon curtains. Little silver stars and planets adorn the curtains in a rather cute manner. He whimpers again. I can't help but be drawn to him, though I'm still cautious and scared of being caught. However, he is asleep. Is he having a bad dream? I didn't think knights would have nightmares. It was understandable for pages, sure. Most are under 20, considering that some sign up after the plague had taken something dear to them. It makes more sense. I creep up to the side of his bed. Calbix has thrashed half of the duvet off of himself in his sleep. He twitches, his ears flick, hearing something vexing in his dream. He looks so vulnerable. There is something so disarming about seeing him in a fit of sleep. It strips away the bravado, the stoic image that I have of him. Even the growl and snap from yesterday fades at the sight of the state that he's in. I reach my right hand towards him leaning over the bed to where he lies strewn in the middle. I hope that I can wake him gently. His exposed chest certainly looks pettable, but I decide his arm would be less alarming to have touched in the dead of night. His fur is so soft, I hadn't considered it before. I could run my hands over it all day. My fingers trace the edges where the dense fur gives way to the coarse patches at the edges of his scars. I'm drawn back into the present when I look at his sleeping face again. Calbix? Hey, um, come on. W wake up, sir. You're having a bad dream. <laughs> Calbix surges upright. His head whips around wildly. His ears flick in alarm, and his eyes open wide. He doesn't register that I'm there at first, even as his arm automatically moves to grab mine in his sudden awakening. <laughs> His eyes come to rest on me. His grip on my arm loosens, but he does not let go. Gorgon. He chokes out hoarsely, blinking as his real eye waters. As his vision clears, he surveys me properly. What are you doing in here? You were moaning in your sleep, sir. You seem distressed, so I thought that I should wake you. I'm whispering to try to calm him. His chest still heaves as he takes in large breaths. Um, I'm sorry for intruding. I can leave if you want, or... No! He blurts it out immediately. His grip on my arm tightens. This time, it's more for comfort than the panic that I felt before. No. No. Please don't. Thank you for waking me. It... I... It was a bad dream, yes. I wait for him to continue, but he lets the silence hang, with him sitting up. It is clear that the bed is soaked in sweat. From the smell, the linen has either not been changed recently, or this is a regular occurrence. My nose wrinkles as I readjust, which makes Calvix realize that he is still holding my arm. He lets go. Oh, sorry. I didn't... I didn't hurt you, did I? I shake my head and smile at him softly. You didn't, Calvix. I'm fine. Uh, just worried about you. Calvix flattens his ears back and looks away, abashed. I'm struck by how open he's being, instead of closing off like normal. I'm glad then. Um. He strokes his own arm comfortingly. It's obvious that he's not too sure what to do. I don't want this moment to slip away. I have to do something. I hold my hand out to him, palm up. His eyes fix on it and then flicks back to mine, his eyebrows turning up with a quizzical look. Come on, let's get you washed up. Let me be your squire for once, okay? He stares at my hand for what feels like forever. I'm not sure what mental gymnastics he's doing as he works to decide whether he will allow the help or not. He places his paw in my hand and then nods. I faintly pull just to get him started. He moves slowly, swinging his legs out of the bed and leaving the 
bedclothes. Oof. I was not expecting him to sleep commando. I have to maintain my respectful gaze as I escort the wary wolf to the bathroom. Even so, it's intimidating. Kalbex doesn't grip me like before, allowing me to pull him along slowly. I take us around the shower units and towards the bath at the back. It's set up like an infinity pool. The water constantly overflows into the grates. Testing the temperature with the toe, it is on the cooler side of lukewarm. Thankfully, the panels on the wall is extremely simple. With only a press, steam starts rising from the water as it's warm immediately. Next to the panel, there is a ledge that I can sit on just above the water's surface. I wade in slowly on the opposite end, hands still loosely linked with Calvix's. Once I am deep enough that the water laps at my waist, I'm assured that the water is invitingly warm enough for Calvix. My underwear is soaked, but I don't want any distractions to give my knight a chance to bolt. I hope that he doesn't see through them. Turning, I realize that his groin is exactly at eye level, and I get a fresh, up-close look. I am glad that the water is hot enough that I can blame my blush on that if asked, but Kelvix still seems out of it when I look up at him. With one last pull and a single step back, I start to lead him into the bath. I continue taking small steps punctuated by the displaced water spilling out and into the grates. Once he is in the water properly, I direct him to sit down and then move up to sit on the bath ledge. My legs dangle in the water with Kelvix nestled between them. I take a moment of triumph. I have gotten my knight into a bath. Go me. Behind me on the ledge, there are a few items for the maintenance and cleaning of fur that look hardly used. I reach over and then pull them closer. The wall also has a variety of dispensers that slide out with a touch. After using a ladle to get Calvix's broad back properly drenched, I lather up some product in my hands and then start working it into his pelt. His fur is dense. His coat is coarse at first, but softer underneath, even on the parts of his back where wounds have healed and scars have formed, have a clear softness to them. I can't help but think of how much he's been through, how many people has he saved. As my mind thinks over the past, we sit in silence. It's only broken by the on slosh of water and the sounds of me scrubbing. I work over his shoulders and then down his back. As I start on his sides, he grunts. I move my hands immediately. Oh, uh, sorry, Kelvix. I didn't hurt you, did I? He turns his head to the right and looks at me with his organic eye. No, no. I am a bit ticklish on my left side. It's all. Sorry. I did not mean to startle you. Um, it... You are doing a good job. If you can, please continue. He doesn't have to tell me twice. I start again, this time being more careful along his sides, especially where the scarring is more pronounced. I am once again reminded of how much he must have been through in his service to this galaxy. Calbix is still such an enigma in terms of what he has been through, but he also stands for everything that I have ever aspired to. Seeing the body of a hero pockmarked with wounds from battle after battle, and yet still fighting despite it all makes a lump form in my throat. I don't know how to express my admiration to thank him. Is it even right to do so now, or will it spoil the scenario that I've been yearning for? How much did it hurt? I speak before thinking. His fur bristles under my hands. Idiot. I can't believe that I said something so stupid. Of all the things too. Yeah. Yeah, it hurt. More than I thought I could bear. Not just the crash. No, it was everything. God that came after. He settles back down into the water. I cautiously return to washing him as he continues. The operations, the rehab, the, the feebleness. It was painful in ways I wasn't, I'm not used to. He drifts off and I just continue, rinsing off the suds I've generated slowly, running a comb through it. He does keep good care of his fur so there are not any mats or tangles to deal with. I... Um, I want to apologize for last night. I... I overreacted. You weren't trying to do anything wrong, and it wasn't your fault the ball fell, I just... I just can't help getting angry when... 
when things that were so easy before aren't anymore. I stay silent. I'm not even sure what I can say. I hold my breath in case that it would break his stride. He turns his head and body enough to look at me with his organic eye again. His expression is sorrowful. I could have talked that before. My reactions. They... They aren't what they were. And I'm constantly reminded of the fact. Day in and day out. In training. In the faces of my fellow knights. I can't even just enjoy a nice fucking meal. I... I'm sorry, Corwin. Please forgive me, I, I don't mean to... I feel... He trails off and turns away again. Where it's finally failing him. We lapse back into silence. I think about how he deserves to feel better. So much better. Seeing his ears sag and his head hang with just his back to me is too much. I tentatively put down the brushes and then reach my hands forward. Without even really thinking of a plan or what would happen, I reach around his shoulders and hug him. My head rests against his wet back as my hands barely span his chest. He bristles initially. His body shudders as I make contact, but it relaxes after a moment. My right cheek is getting wet. A trickle of water runs down my face, but I ignore it. Even though I initially smell his damp fur, the scents of the products really do come through. I don't think that I'll ever smell pine and not think of Calvix now. We sit for a while longer. Neither of us move much. Maybe we're both afraid of breaking the spell. Eventually, I do think of what to say. I forgive you, Calvix. I do. I am to blame, too. I haven't been doing what I should in putting your needs first. I've been pushing myself on your life and your routine. I should have recognized what you do and don't need. I'm sorry. We return to silence, but this time there is a light comfortableness to it now that the air has been cleared. A slapping noise catches my attention. The source appears to be Kalbix's tail splashing the water as it wags. I'm glad that he feels better now, too. I could spend the whole day here, in this little safe haven from the world outside, a place where just me and my knight are momentarily happy. The sun, however, doesn't have the decency to allow this. Like a voyeur, streaks of light creep into the bathroom and fall across us. I squint at my new nemesis furiously. We... <clears throat> we should get ready. You have a full day. And I have group combat maneuvers with the new pack formation to contend with. He sounds like he'd like a bit longer as well. That makes me feel better even though we have to stop. As he stands, I get a perfectly lined up view of his rear. Even waterlogged, it is a feast. I avert my gaze knowing that my eyes have already seared the image into my brain. I busy myself with cleaning up the brushes and tools. He enters a shower unit and then the air turns on. I wash my face quickly to kill the blush that crept up on it. Standing, I motion to Kalbix that I am heading back to my room. His fur is fluffing up intensely from the dryer and I have to suppress a laugh. He nods and waves back, so I head out. After Kalbix finishes up, I have my own brief wash. I then dress, grab a night's supply of my clothes and bundle them into my pack. Heading down, I see him chugging his first tonic of the day. I'm pleased that I have completed the last night at least. He's also dressed in his gear today. From the smart mesh to the plating, it is clear that it is custom tailored. I recall that he said that he was doing combat stuff today. That also reminds me of something else he said. Oh, uh, you said that there was a new pack formation thing today? He finishes the drink and then stows a flask on his hip before addressing me. Ah, oh, yes, that's right. Whenever new knights take on new squires, there is usually a reconstruction of the makeup of the teams. For Commander Orion decides the packs and organizes training. These four to five packs will make a unit that coordinates during engagements. It's important to synchronize our actions between packs. So we, the knights, do training sessions with the suggested packs to get comfortable with one another. We could be working with knights we have never met before, or familiar ones. Which also means our squires will be a pack too. 
Normally, that is to say, often, the knights and squires are considered as one when making passing units, but the commander prefers to do things his way and focus on knights' synergy. He stops, realizing he's spoken at length. He looks around as if not sure if he should continue. So, yes. You will likely get informed shortly who we are grouped with. Okay, that makes sense. I guess I'll have to suck it up and work my best with the other squires that I end up with then. Mm. I pause, tentative if I should ask, but decide to get his advice. Any tips on how to act? Or, or work well in a squire team? There is some part of me that hates asking, but Calvix has been so honest and open this morning. I'd like that to continue, which means that I have to be open to relying on him too. Calvix tilts his head and considers. I wonder how many different units he's been a part of, where there are other knights he would rather work with, and those he doesn't want to. Um, well, if you are, I mean, if we are lucky, then we will get teammates that we help with. Know that often you will find things you are better at than them, and vice versa. Accepting this and working to cover one another's blind spots will prove crucial lot in the battlefield. He checks his STIK and then motions towards the hall. We will talk more once we know who we are with. We must get out now. Go to the canteen and get some breakfast. Consider a drier option today. First time in zero gravity training can do a number on your stomach. I nod rapidly. I have no intention of making a public vomiting scene and then being told to decontaminate an entire training room orbiting Osid. Kalvik strides ahead and I jog to keep pace. Did you ever, um, hurl asteroids, that is? Kelvik stares at me for the briefest of seconds, with shock before cracking the biggest smile that I've ever seen on him yet. His chuckle is deep and melodious. <laughs> Good one. There isn't a night out there who has not had a meal come back up one time or another during training. It happens. Don't fret about that. And yes, I have made a few meteor strikes. So, I will not debush these details just yet. He chuckles and picks up the pace. It's so odd seeing him full of mirth that I feel like I'm experiencing a different night entirely. His tail wags as he moves ahead, and the corners of my mouth tug into a smile. Alas, all good things come to an end as we reach the junction to head off to the canteen. Kalbix offers me a wave as he moves off towards the facility before he returns to his STIK, reading more messages. Elated, I head inside to grab a meal, a dry meal. With some toast and berry selected for my breakfast, I head towards the only destination that I can take. Zarya's manic arm waves are too obvious to ignore. Not that I'd avoid her anyway, but certainly I am not about to see what happens if one ignores her attempts at getting attention. Oh good, you spotted me. Everyone else is in such a rush this morning. I thought that you missed me. You nervous? I'm excited to see what kind of exercise it will be doing up there. She jabs a mechanical digit upwards to emphasize that she means Belvos, as if there would be anything else on my mind right now. I throw a few berries in my mouth and chew them hurriedly before answering. Yeah, a bit, but mostly I'm looking forward to trying it. The moon I was on before was… well, it didn't have the facility to really try true weightlessness. I can't wait to feel what it's like to maneuver completely untethered. Zarya is also sticking to a non-fluid breakfast today. She crunches some kind of meaty-looking protein bar. Have you had many chances to train in Zero-G yourself? She looks sheepish as she flexes her paws. They pulse with a burst of energy. Yeah, a few times. But it was mostly to test how these function. Since they can use gravity tech, it was important to make sure that they operate in a variety of situations. She makes small circles as if waxing a hole. I'm glad that I got the practice. Using any inertia that I have and alternating my arm's output, I can sort of control myself. I still need to get used to doing it and orienting myself while other things are happening. Uh, that's why I'm so pumped to get up there and try. Some tigress mating ritual? Alex comes into view looking at Zarya with amusement. His mouth and whiskers twitch in an attempt to not snigger. Zarya, of course, stops her circular movements and flails instead. Gah! You infuriating tube sock. I'll have you know that I was showing Corwin here techniques that 
once perfected, will aid us in battle. Alex gives me a twinkling side eye, and I can't help but join in. I don't doubt that. Rest assured that I am not so cheap that I could be wooed by a piece of toast and a dance. Zarya will have to wine and dine me later tonight in Belvus if she wants to seduce me into some zero-gravity coupling. To say her cheeks and upper neck turn a few colors darker may be an understatement. She looks fit to burst as she seethes, glaring back and forth at the two of us. You two are intolerable. I swear, you both better watch out so that I don't give you something to really regret in our next sparring session. Alex takes his place, graceful as ever, as he laughs. It's quite nice, high-pitched and genuine in its mirth. Ah, peace, cousin, peace. We both do it in good jest. You react so wonderfully to any jab that it is quite irresistible, although we will cease if it is truly bothering you. Zarya huffs and then demolishes the remainder of her meat bar, glowering at me with intensity. The gnashing of her teeth feels like a thinly veiled promise. Y yeah, sorry, Zarya. Believe me, you're the last person that I would want to have a vendetta against me. Having worked out her rage on the snack, she sighs contently and then relaxes her posture. No, I know you both are just teasing. It's just... I'm not good at dealing with that kind of social interaction. I didn't have any siblings, and all the other pupils and pages in our clan were very well disciplined. She shrugs. Her motorized shoulders whirl as if to emphasize her dour mood. Jabs and jokes are weapons that I have not had to wield, and my proficiency with trying to come up with a counterattack to your strikes is severely lacking. I'm more frustrated than I can't join in. She finishes off her meal with a gulp and looks a little crestfallen. Zarya, you'll pick it up. If you just relax and say the first thing that pops into your head when we make a joke, it'll likely be the best comeback. You may even throw Alex off his game. She nods and thinks for a moment. Her muzzle works around the words before she speaks up again. Well... What I immediately thought to say back to your zero-gravity comment was, you'll need more than wine after I'm done with you, and a new pelvis, but I thought it was too... lewd. Oh, Corwin, are you alright? I regret continuing to eat as she spoke, and end up choking on a berry that got stuck in the second that she mentioned shattering my pelvis. Alex whacks me on the back and I cough up the lodged-up fruit. Well, Zarya, I think we can say that your immediate thought for a rebuttal is indeed the best weapon. You've certainly defeated our poor friend here. His tail is practically dancing with laughter, even as he passes me a napkin to wipe my mouth and then strokes my back softly. Zarya's face, however, transformed from initial shock and worry to jubilation. Oh boy, you're right, Alex. I got him. I should just say what I think of in the moment. She turns her head, surveying the crowd for a moment. Eventually, she locks onto a, a squat squire with his thick tusks, tucking into a meal. She hollers over. Hey, Rorscher, remember that time on the Ark ship on the way over? Well, I wanted to say then that... She bounds off with a glee towards her target. I'm about to listen in when a tickle in my left ear makes me turn to the feline leaning in close. Um, since we have a moment, I... I should apologize for what you witnessed in the loggers yesterday. I was... That is to say, mm, I let my temper get the best of me. I am sorry that you had to see that. With everything that had happened afterwards with Calbex, I had completely forgotten the scene between him and Brute. He looks genuinely admonished. I don't really feel that he should. I place my hand on his left paw. He doesn't flinch, yet it returns my gaze warily. It's fine, Alex. Brute knows how to irritate the best of us. I don't think you flipping out was that normal. Maybe... Just punch up next time. Alex looks away and withdraws his paw. No, I lost control. I should not have. It was uncouth of me to stoop to his level. Lower, even. I can't be going around losing it just because someone is being obnoxious. I must rise above such petty aggravations. I'm about to ask him more, but Zarya bounces back and takes her spot again. She looks back to her victim, whose jaw is so low now, that I fear her meal will escape. I'm actually curious to know what she said based on the surrounding squire's faces being sh between shock and giggles. That was refreshing. I can see that you are right, Corwin. 
I should be more confident in the hidden humor within. Everything all right? Her beaming smile falters seeing us, but Alex waves off her concern and returns her smile with his own. Nothing to concern yourself with, Zarya. Just some pre-training jitters. His voice is level, but his tail is tucked around himself tightly. I think that I handled that poorly, but I'm not sure what to say. Not to mention, he clearly doesn't want to talk about it more with Zarya here. I am rescued from my dilemma as our STI case chime. Not just three of us, but many throughout the room. A murmur travels throughout the room as we collectively check the messages. I defer to pulling up a hollow screen and reading it through. Pack formation announcement. Alert. Pack formation alteration. Corwin Stringer. Squire 2 Cavalry Knight Kelpix. I... Our, our Riga? This alert is to inform you of a formation or alteration to your Knight's Pack. Cavalry Knight Kelvix. Ariga is now part of Pack Ma. Pack Ma composition. CK Kelvix Ariga. S. Corwin Stringer. CK Cyrox the Mawful. S. Zarya Melrexis. CK Cannon Tobes. S. Alexandrite Hieronus. Chronos? Hi, Chronos. CD RK Fen Orion S Brute Severus CKC Jez? That is awfully close to another word. S Gladius Rondus. Familiar familiarize yourself with the new packmates. A linked chat has been generated to facilitate communication. Additional training access has been granted for coordination training. Addendum. Pac Ma is confirmed for after duty recreational activities on Belvos. I can hardly believe it. I look up from the screen at the two others. No, my new pack mates. Zarya is still reading, but I can tell from her general vibrations that she's happy. Alex doesn't actually have his STIK out, but is instead thumbing one of the earrings with his eyes closed. I hadn't realized, but it must be some auxiliary interface. Eventually, his eyes open up and smiles over to me with a wink, and then Zarya startles us both with a fist pump. Fuck yeah! Ma, buddies! She practically leaps over the table and grabs us both in a loose headlock. I lean into it happily. Zarya is amazing. I couldn't be more glad to have her looking after my back. Alex, too. After removing himself from her grip, he beams. I agree with your statement, Zarya. I'll feel more confident in battle with both of you by my side, not to mention that our knights are all of high renown and aptitude. It only makes sense that we would be in the mall. Zarya bops, tugging me along for the ride before I too squirm free. Looking around, I can see the general consensus is overall happy, though I do see some disgruntled looks. I can't believe that we're in a mall, though, I mean, I guess I should have guessed. They'd be a fool to have Cyrox anywhere but at the head. But I'm so glad that you're both with me. Hello? She makes a face as she looks over the list once more. I can guess who she is displeased with. We'll have to deal with the angry puppy. Maybe we can beat friendship into him with plenty of extra practice sessions. Hmm. She slams her fists together with that promise and I smile. Sure, I'm not the biggest fan of angry and angrier but it would have been a miracle to be grouped with everyone that I liked. I can handle Brute and Fen. At least, I'm determined to. Being close to the commander's gaze will certainly make me more nervous than not, but I'll just have to keep training as often as I can keep up. Seeing the time, I jab Zarya in the side with a finger to get her attention. I'm happy to be with you two as well, but we need to head off. We have to head to the hangar for the transport. We can't be late for our first formal outing, right? She checks her STIK and nods. Alex finishes off his meal quickly and then gives us a thumbs up. We make our way out of the canteen and around towards KAU complex entrance, but instead of entering, we head down the path to where we originally landed in the Ark ship. I'm still buzzing with excitement and more than a little relief. Zarya, Alex, and Eryx are great pack mates to have. I still haven't seen Zarya and Alex in close quarter combat, but I'll have no doubt that they are both exceptional. How can I fit into this formation? What do I offer? 
I'm a reasonable shot at the moment, but that won't help much if the play gets close. Lives would be lost if I let them pass me because I am not proficient enough in close-range combat. The announcement mentioned that we had more access to facilities now. I think that I'll make use of them when we get back. The vessel that we'll be ascending in is more of a glorified elevator capsule than a craft, circular with no middle section. It looks like a large donut. As we move further inside the hangar, I realize part of the vehicle is open. Besides this section, a hovering workbench and some maintenance tools stand ready. I also spot Eric leaning over the vehicle, handing some tools down as a mechanical hand reaches up to take them. I realize it's night. Jizz. Can I call him Jazz? I'm just gonna call him Jazz, I'm sorry. Is underneath. The hand must belong to one of their graft arms. Heading over, I can hear muttering emanating from them. There we go, sweetie. Oh yeah, right there. You need it a little tighter? Don't worry, I got ya. Squire, yo-yo wrench, now! One of the mechanical arms juts out and it waves impatiently, palm up towards Eric's. He glances over the workbench for a moment, brow furrowing as his eyes scan the various implements before he spots the one requested and places it quickly into the awaiting hand. The armor tracks quickly with its prize. Ah, splendid job, Eryx. Here we go, baby. Shush, shush. Don't creak. I'm gonna be real gentle. Ready? Okay, here I go. A sudden screech of metal makes us all jump. Then, with an almost purr, lights flare underneath as the craft whirls back to life. The procyanoid slides out from underneath with a massive grin on their face. Ah, there we go. Just needed some tough love. Oh, an audience? Hmm? They're using their graft arms to push off the floor. Jazz wipes their paws on their uniform. I don't think that they could spoil them further. And then extends a mechanical arm each to the three of us. I take the hand offered and marvel at how, well, organic it feels. The material is as soft as skin, even though I can tell it's metal, and it flexes as I shake it, just as realistically as I would expect flesh and blood. Ah, yes. I was gonna hunt down the new pack fodder and examine them. Hmm, yes, yes. What I would expect. All but Zarya are released from the handshake, as her mechanical arms instead all converge on her, delicately moving over Zarya's own cybernetic arms. Jazz steps up and looks at them with scrutiny. Zarya, hmm? Yes, I heard a lot about you from the billowing thundercloud. Cyrox is a serial flatterer, though, so don't let it get to your head. Hmm, interesting. Zarya blushes as the knight just continues on, paying no real attention to her arms, making them move and checking the motorization. Hmm, I've been wanting to see some of those combat units your lot makes for a while. Not quite the finesse that I'd go with, but I'll admit the housing and conduits for handling the strain looks solid. Perhaps you'll come to my workshop one day and I can get a proper look, right, squire? The question isn't really a question, and Zarya just sculpts and nods. I've never seen her so demure before. The captain's eyes travel over Alex and then me, studying me intensely, but with none of the warmth that they held for Zarya's cybernetics. Where are you from, lad? I snap to attention. Uh, Foro, Captain. Their eyes soften somewhat. Ah, the pieces fit. Salt of the earth people out that way, squire. You should be proud of your roots, but also, will you choose to be here too? Turning and seeing more squires approaching, they clap their three pairs of hands and look at Eric's. Well, let's get this floating saucer up and running, shall we? I think that we'll shave three seconds off the time thanks to my ump, uh, I mean, repair work. Grinning, Jazz drags Eric's off by the arm to do some final checks, pointing in multiple directions at once and barking orders as a bear runs back and forth. They're quirky and energetic, but I kind of like that. Zarya looks wary as she strokes her arms. I, I think the captain wants to operate on me. No, no. No, I don't think so. Right, Corwin? Alex looks at me as if I should know. All I can do is shrug. Zarya shudders. As we wait, I spot Brute stalk in. His ears are so flat against his head that they look like they've been blown off. He's carrying a small pack held tightly under his right arm 
and gives everyone a wide berth. I sigh, as much as I have very little desire to speak to the man, Kalbix's words about accepting one another's faults rings in my ears. I beckon him over with a half-hearted wave. Brute sees me, glares, and then deflates. He double-checks his pack, is firmly under his arm before prowling over. Great. With you, I saw. The pussy. The dick. The coward. And... you. He gestures towards me with a dismissive flick of his head, as if I was an insult all in myself. Great. I'm already regretting this. Zarya having recovered from her examination pipes in. I think I saw that opera on stage. Wouldn't that make you... The mutt? She grins. Although I appreciate her newfound funny bone, the reaction on Brute's face is priceless. I do fear that her new impulse responses may have been, uh, best better left sleeping. Brute growls back his response warningly. I'm watching you all. Fen, I mean, Commander Fen may want your knights alongside him. But I'll bet that he doesn't give a fuck about you lot. Which means that I have to deal with you and hope that you don't drag me down to your level. He locks eyes with Alex, who doesn't meet them, and looks at the craft instead. Brute's eyes flip to me, then Zarya, and then back to me. I can feel him gauging whether or not I spoke about what happened between him and Alex yesterday. I raise an eyebrow, then faintly shake my head. I didn't really feel that it was my place getting into that here, and I hope that they both just let the incident go. Brute seems to relax by maybe a micron but then bristles as he sees most of the other pack starts to approach the craft. He checks his belongings again, then shuffles inside. Zarya watches him leave, then gives us all exasperated looks as she shakes her head and sighs. <sighs> well, he's... just awful at team bonding speeches, isn't he? I guess we'll have to grin and bear it for now. Maybe once he sees my moves, he'll be so impressed that he'll unclench and let that stick drop out. I balk at her. Oh god, she's becoming a monster. A glorious monster. I laugh and pat her back as we head inside. Alex follows, still distant. It is probably best to let him mold this over himself. As we strap in and Erox and Jess do some last minute checks, everything must be fine because Erox jogs inside soon after. He sits down and settles in, a few seats down to the right. The roof of the hangar opens like a flower, the sections folding out like petals. We all squint as the sun comes glaring in. The craft hums and begins to slowly rise just off the ground. I've heard these crafts use satellites as guiding buoys and then shoot upwards like a cork underwater, clamoring for the surface. The circular vessel starts to spin, picking up force as we slowly move out up out of the hangar. The force pulls me forward against the harness as we speed up. I can't see them, but the night captain hooves out as our velocity ramps up. Let's see how much faster we can go then. Hope you all have strong stomachs. Start the timer, Erex. We're gonna smash the old record. Got it? I hear a faint whimpering confirmation from him as Jazz crows back. Perfect. Okay, three, two, one, mark. As they call out, there is a stomach lurching sensation as the centrifuge force instantly transitions to vertical momentum and we rocket away from the complex. The shuddering of the craft rocks my body. I press my tongue to the roof of my mouth for fear of chattering teeth may bite it. I can hear a few moans and a few heaves as we continue our ascent. We're still spinning, but it's nothing compared to before. I close my eyes to help with the nausea. As we exit the planet's surface, the shuddering lessens and then stops. It feels safe to open my eyes. Once again, I am blown away by the sight of Ossid. It is so verdant and full of life. I wonder if we will get to travel much of the planet outside of training. Something to ask Kalbix, I guess. I'm shaken from my spectating as we pass by the first guidance satellite. It passes through the hole in the middle of the craft. Afterwards, we are suddenly thrown into another trajectory. Looking up through the clear roof, we are clearly aligned towards the next one, and beyond that, another. We slingshot around the planet using these buoys to change our path automatically and keep our momentum. I marvel at the ingenuity of it, though from a few groans and some faint splashes, not all the other passengers agree. After we pass over the next relay, the city comes into view. Belvos looks way more impressive up close. In yesterday's lesson, we learned that it has a multitude of scanning arrays and defenses for the city itself. 
Seeing the scale and design of the station, it gives the impression of us approaching a fortress rather than a city. Not that it is a tourist destination by any means. With more people living and working abroad, the living quarters have been expanded over and over until it became a sprawling metropolis. In my stupor, I've missed the approach. Through the screens, I see the access dock we are rocketing towards. Come on! Come on! Come on! Our eager chaperone spurns the ship faster as we glide into a circular entrance on the side of the structure. We decelerate immediately as a magnetic eddy brings our velocity down. Clamps eventually grasp us, and we dock fully. Time! Tell me! Ooh! Tell me! I think we did it! Even as we are being rotated and moored up, the Procyanoid Knight has unstrapped themselves and scuttled over to their squire to get the verdict. Erox pops up his left arm for Jazz to read, and, after taking a moment to go over the readout, they whoop triumphantly. Hot damn! A whole 0.4 gain! Ha! Take that, Wallace. You'll be footing my bill next time. Two sets of palms rub together with clear glee as the last mechanical set ruffles Eric's head for a little too vigorously. Well done, everyone. Good job not throwing off the weight circulations. I'll make sure that you all get extra credits for not causing us to explode en route. As they crow some more and move towards the exit, I can't be certain if that was a joke or not. If it wasn't, was this reward a bribe to not speak of this to anyone? I really can't tell what jazz is about, but they certainly liven up the scene. Walking out and into the bay, it looks like some sort of manic automated sorting machine. Conveyors, partitions, and chutes crisscross the area in a mechanical spider wave of operations. Cargo from the surface is being offloaded from another transport automatically. The system sends all the crates and boxes into every which way. I feel exhausted just looking at it go. Come now, Corwin. Let us not make a repeat of our first day and stare. If you do, you'll likely get left behind or collide with some handsome stranger. Alex pulls me out of my staring with small tickles into my sides. Even when teasing, his paws are so soft and delicate where they touch. I wouldn't have noticed if he hadn't spoken first. Jolting away, I smirk at him as we jog after the others. Jazz has their nose stuck firmly in a hollow screen as they tap away, barely even looking as they walk and weave between workers and machinery. Done. Hmm. Read my logs and weep, Wallace. Get dusty pangolin. Oh, right. Here we are. Freight elevator. All in. Now. We all crowd in before the doors slide closed. The lift ascends out of the hold and into the city. The glass windows give us a view over the walkways and avenues of the residential sector. The area is painted with dark colors, interspersed with lots of plants and trees. I can even see a park with some lazily bubbling water fountains. The streams curling slowly through the air like a lava lamp. Walkways and various transit lines break up the city into pieces, like some giant complex jigsaw. Each part is perfectly designed for efficient travel. The elevator comes to a stop and we exit. The area that we have been delivered to looks more KAU oriented. There are a few knights walking through the open lobby area. Many of them are in flight suits or armored gear, likely on duty and ready in case that they need to deploy. The material certainly looks sturdy, defensive, and even intimidating. I'll be wearing something similar soon enough. Jazz walks through the area while still working on their STIK screens. They use their mechanical arms to weave or otherwise acknowledge when someone calls to them. Just off the initial lobby is a door that the captain ambles into. It's a small room with a bunch of benches and some monitors. There are lockers on the back wall along with what appears to be weapon displays like those in the training room. I take my place on the bench next to Zarya, who is bouncing both knees in clear excitement. Alex joins us on the other side. Eric sits with us on Alex's free side. Root chooses a bench away from everyone, sitting on the end and tucking his pack between his legs. His back may be straight, but his tail is tucked between his legs and his ears are reaching to every noise. Maybe he isn't good with shuttle travel? Jazz comes around to the front and after putting away their STIK, services Foldy with a smirk. Well, you know why you're here. You need to get used to floating around and maybe some coordination. And as I just saw, some of you need to hold your lunches. I mean breakfast. Better. They grin as some of the squires shrink in embarrassment. You have to get used to it. As squires, you will be flung and jettisoned out of the dropships regularly, usually being shot planet side or for emergency tactics. 
Regardless, you will all spend time in weightless situations. Their various hands splay wide as if they could shotgun us out into space in all directions. They chuckle before continuing. My main job is not to babysit you. I'll be engaging, firing the steed ships, coordinating backup, and scanning for more plague vessels. I will have zero time for zero-g babies. The way their graph arms mirror their organic arms to emphasize their point would be funny. If the subject matter wasn't so serious, I lean in and focus. I don't want to miss a word. That being said, have fun with it. You all got your pack, assignments. So we'll use this as bonding experience. Groove up, put your stuff in the lockers here, and go configure something cool. With what could only be called mischievous glee, they scuttle off through the far door, leaving us all to prep. Brood is up and at the lockers right away. I can see him using the STIK to access one before stowing their items away, locking it with another swipe across the panel. He then tests the door a few times before he's seemingly content. I visibly see him relax a bit. He sees me watching and scowls, securing his STIK in his gear. He moves out of the way of everyone else as we also put our things away. With everything taken care of, the squires naturally separate into their packs, moving away to mutter in hushed tones. Strategy meetings, perhaps? Hard to really plan when we don't know what we're doing. Ahem. <clears throat> Alex makes a noise and we turn to him. Even Brute faces him, though his perpetual scowl only deepens. As this is our first formal exercise as a mob pack, I think that we should make sure that we approach whatever the captain devise with some form and order. I'd like your input and ideas as to what we may face and how to tackle the situation. He seems to be in a much more formal mood now. I myself have limited experience with weightlessness. Overall, I clocked in only a few dozen hours total. The simulations were solo, mostly based on survival from a breach. How about you? He looks about the group. I suppose now is a best a time as any. I... I have no real experience with zero gravity. Our moon didn't really have the resources or equipment to give us any worthwhile practice, save for harnesses, simulations, and the very rare shuttle trip, if there was room and time. I try my best to keep my expression neutral. They are my pack and I already feel like I can trust them, well, most of them, with some of my lacking areas. The others nod as they listen, though Brute just stares with an odd expression. It's unnerving, and I'm glad when Zarya pipes up. I had a lot of experience before the accident. She gestures to her arms and shrugs. It'll take a little while to really get a good feel for it, especially with how they position the gravity thrusters on the arms. It's different from a suit's placements. I only got a few hours in once they cleared me, and it was mostly tests rather than practice. She flexes her arms and various nodes, pulse briefly along them. I look at my own gear. I know small emitters are built into it that can create minute gravitational fields acting as backup to the ones on full armor houses in case of failure. We are taught as pages that in the event that we end up in space, we would have to use these to slow any momentum that we had to prevent us being thrown beyond a reasonable search radius. A scary thought, though the drills that we went through seem comical when juxtapositioned with the terrifying reality that they trained us for. Uh, I have been put to rather uh, big out of straining. Most of it was re-engaging or re-entry drops. Not that I recommend it, but if we have to do that, I can give you some pointers. We gawk at him. It wasn't unheard of that if you were close enough to an asteroid or a planet, that the armor could handle an orbital landing. However, doing so with any damage to the suit could spell disaster. To think Eryx had been trained excessively in that tactic was worrisome, to say the least. That is impressive, Eryx. I am not certain that will be on today's schedule, but I would very much like to discuss your expertise on this later. I am not in agreement. I doubt that there are any squires, new or veteran, that had much actual experience in freefall landings. Knowing any advanced tactics in the circumstances that we had to make one surely would be better than only knowing how in theory. Sure. I only mention it because Jess go totally make us practice that. When I mentioned it this morning, they got this maniac gleaming their eyes. Probably no, though, right? He chuckles nervously. I think the line between total respect and fear for this knight is razor thin. Hmm. 
our moody wallflower snorts, and we turn to him. He looks like he has half a mind to stay silent before finally gracing us with his thoughts. The Knight Captain won't do that. Not for pack exercise. We'll likely do grav grappling and asteroid hopping. It's the best way for those without much experience to get the grips with orientating. What? He crosses his arms and huffs when we stare at him. It's probably the only time that I've actually ever heard him speak without insult falling out of his mouth. That right? Sounds like you know a lot about this stuff, Root. Care to share? His ears flick and his muzzle curls in irritation. I assume Zarya is about to be shut down, but Root answers. I had plenty of experience as a debris junker. Moving about is easy if you can latch onto something or use a point of reference. Look. He huffs again as all of our attention is on him. Even trying to keep the air of detachment, his tuck tail twitches. Maybe he does like showing off a little. I'm not thrilled about being lumped with you all, but the commander wants it, so I have to suck it up, so... He points to Alex and then Eryx. You two, at least, should be good enough to handle what we face. We'll coordinate and choose an orientation to start off with. Then, even if they can't pick up maneuvering fast enough, we should still do well. He gestures to me than Zarya. There's the mood killing that I was expecting. I imagine it's more directed at me than Zarya. He notices our collective scowls. Ugh. Seriously, what? You said it yourself, rich boy. We're in Maw. We have to make sure that we don't look like idiots, and we can't be seen fucking flailing about. You wanted a plan? We have one now. Done. Hmm. He goes back to staring away again. He may be as subtle as a club, but he did actually make sense. It's so annoying that he came up with a reasonable plan. I immediately want to say it's shit. He's still a garbage wolf. <sighs> Brute is right, at least about the plan. You three should take point. Zarya and I will follow. Don't worry, I... We won't hold back. The others glance my way. Brute looks validated and smirks. Alex and Eric still seem unsure, and Zarya just glares angrily at Brute. Well, fine. We'll go with this formation. If need be, we'll change it up. Let's get into position. Seeing the others had conveyed their strategy meetings and are starting to line up at the door, our uneasy pack lines up too. Although Brute's assessment was likely true, it still stings. We wait to see what lies beyond. I feel excitement and nervous flutter inside me. I can't wait to actually experience this. Sure, I don't want to make a fool of myself, but I've always wanted to feel true weightlessness. I'm not about to let the dour wolf ruin this. The doors in front of us illuminate and then softly open. So that's where I'm going to leave it for today. So. We got to see some interesting stuff. Or, oh yeah, uh-huh. We finally have Calbix becoming a bit more open with Corwin. Um, he explained more or less his behavior, which, I mean, I'm not going to toot my own horn, but I get, I technically was right. You know, he's, he's the wounded warrior. Um, he's not to say he's too proud to ask for help, but he, he's finally coming to realize the fact that he needs help, that he came back differently from whatever it is that happened to him. Um, there's no talk about his squire yet, um, whether or not that is important. Um, but yeah, he basically opened up a bit to Corwin, which is good. It's, you know, building up the relationship that these two are supposed to have. I mean, they're on the main title screen. <laughs> um... We also got the pack assignments, which was hinted at when uh, Kalbeck said that he was going to be put into a new pack formation. So with that comes a new pack assignment. And as you can see, it's it's all the characters that we already met. So obviously, uh, including Brute. But hopefully that means that Brute is going to be more... Mm. 
he's going to be less antagonistic uh, and more of a teammate because, I mean, considering what they're fighting and the whole how they all function, you kind of have to have people acting as groups. You can't just be acting as like a lone wolf, so to speak. So it makes sense that they would have to be paired up and that they have to get along or else, you know, they're not going to function properly. And then, you know, what's going to be the, the point of them if they cannot work with other people, which I guess is something that, you know, is going to come hard to brute, but, you know, you have to get over it. Um, and so do you, so do the other group or pack mates, because I mean, just because you guys get along doesn't mean that you can't put in the effort to try to get along with Brute. Anywho, so what else, what else, what else? We also got to meet, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but I'm just going to keep calling him Jazz, okay? The Procyanid. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly either, but uh, basically Space Raccoon with the arm graphs, making him look like Doc Ock. Um, pretty interesting character. Um, I can kind of see how or why they would place, um, his name is Erox, Erox, or no, is Gladios. Gladius, the bear. Well, they would put him with Space Raccoon Boy because one is like very like he's just like all over the place. He's like he's smart. He's very he's similar to Zarya's, Zarya's um, knight but a bit different, I guess. I don't know. It, it looks like they, they wouldn't mesh together well which uh, again i'm assuming that's the whole purpose of you getting a specific knight and the whole purpose of Kalbix getting corwin the the corwin is just there to be his for lack of better word um attendant and Kalbix kind of has to get used to that anyway so what did you think you know leave it down in the comments and thank you all for watching slash listening if you would like to play in finite space yourself, you can do so by going down into the link in the description, which should have a direct link to the itch.io page of in finite space. And, you know, you could just also just go to, you know, itch.io and download it from there. You know, just search in finite space and ta-da, it should be there. Um, I will also be posting down their Patreon if they have one, their coffee if they have one, whatever it is that they use for support in case you want to support them. And yeah, all that down in the description, along with any other pertinent links. And I guess that's it for now. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye bye.